Hello everyone. So my name is No Shagan. Um, many of you will know me with my background in Let's Improve Workplace Wellbeing, where I work together with the leadership team and Ryan Briggs um, to facilitate bringing together wellbeing leads to learn and share from best practice. My day job is as a projects and people manager for JSBC Labs. Uh, we have the privilege and honor to be able to work with a team of developers on a back end system. I also am quite actively involved in a number of different advisory boards, etc., and a contributory member of the Workplace Wellbeing Initiative as part of the Global Wellness Institute. And then as if my job isn't enough, I am enthused about my position at Finwell, where I work as a wellbeing strategist, stroke financial wellbeing advisor in the capacity of specifically focusing on financial wellbeing strategies. So at IKEA a few years ago, I was the head of health and well-being, where I looked at the well-being strategy for 11 and a half thousand employees. Where my journey started, of course, where most well-being leads start is actually understanding where we were in terms of well-being. And I think this is a very key position when you think of well-being. So, of course, at the time I looked at physical, mental, social and financial and what I did at that point was actually looking at the data and the questions we were asking and what popped out the most at me and what I really dug into is really understanding financial well-being. Because, of course, when I looked at the data, at least two thirds of the population were saying that they were having challenges in understanding financial well-being in the first instance. They didn't think they had the tools or the know-how of how to actually navigate it and we did see a lot of trends around questions being asked around pension etc and when I dug a little bit deeper I guess looking at the financial well-being and what it meant is it means different things to different people um, you know you can have an individual when you do some focus groups and really speaking to people in that they are in a position where they perhaps not in the best of relationships they need to move on but they don't have necessarily the money to create this deposit that allows them to move on. So I think it was very much approach of looking at quantitative data as well as the qualitative, really understanding and speaking about it. And how does it actually influence the whole holistic well-being strategy? Because when we do look at financial well-being, this is where we saw a bit of the problems coming through in terms of sleep. You know, something as unrelated perhaps is whether you have asthma problems, you know, the more you stress over money, the more chances are that you'll be having breathing difficulties. So I think for me, it was a really fact finding mission as to understanding the correlation between the impact of financial well-being on everyone else. But of course, that was the one that flagged up the most at the time. Looking at financial well-being and that interrelationship with mental health and its impact, I think the conversation perhaps five years ago was very much around musculoskeletal issues, mental health conversation was coming through, we looked at cancer. These were the kind of trends that perhaps we were looking at. And we've come a really long way today compared to where we were, but really honing in on financial well-being. I think the first thing that we can appreciate is we are seeing much more open conversations around the topic of money, which is really reassuring for me, because of course, when I set up many years ago, it was something that was a bit looked at as, oh, this is very tricky ground. And perhaps was also not identified as something that would be picking up as a trend. We see now that the acceleration of many businesses looking at financial well-being and again looking at its interlink to mental health. And we see, you know, where we talk about physical unwellness related to stressing over money, it does impact your mental health. If you are stressing or you are thinking about it all the time, and is going to impact your productivity, your presenteeism, whether you get ill, etc. And we're seeing that more and more needs to be done about addressing some of the issues. It's about how are you creating the psychological safety, the safety for people to open up to say they do have an issue. And if they do, that there's the proper resources and the proper support, much like we do with mental health, for them. Because the services and the education and the guidance, etc., is available out there. I think what we can look at is probably the key trends and topics that we're seeing at the moment. And I always go back to that intersectionality between diversity and inclusion and this financial well-being agenda. And this goes across the board. You know, when we think about ourselves, 
we are perhaps all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. We are not all at the same level of incomes. We're not at the same level of our savings, our pensions, looking at where we are for the future comings. You know, some are looking at their first time buyer journey. Some are looking at perhaps where they are in their retirement journey. So it's really important to look at this intersectionality, but then also putting another lens to it. And I often talk about my personal experience, and I think this is quite vital because we don't look at the stresses and the strains that sometimes individuals have because of their cultural background. So for me, my unit of when I think of financial well-being, I've got to think not only of my unit in terms of myself, I also have to think extended in terms of family. Now, within South Africa, we often talk about something between ourselves like we talk about the black tax. It means that when you go to university, you earn a degree, you come out and you work, you actually then not only support your unit, but you also support the Ubuntu, which is your community, your outside area. So I think it's very important for us to start opening up those conversations with our employees from diverse backgrounds to really understand how it works. Another really key element that I, I came across as well within my research around financial well-being is just the, the type of understanding when it comes to money and the control of money. Now, amongst Asian people, and I'm not making a sweeping statement when I say that, a lot of the time do we actually understand that often it's the man that can control the finances. So in terms of that relationship, what does that mean? And I think it can go, you know, of course, to a, a number of different people. But what we're trying to draw a light on is in terms of that. Now we can give you a whole lecture in terms of that intersectionality between diverse minority ethnic groups and financial well-being. But we are seeing more of a trend and the conversations coming up around that. And linked also to that is I think we need to think about financial well-being as well as financial abuse. A lot of control happens around money. So we now need to, and I see the trend more and more, starting to open up those conversations. I am reassured then in some of the work that's being done by Standards International, by HSBC, where we are seeing this conversation come out and actually how our financial advisors or people within the finance sector understanding what that means and understanding how to take those um, key insights, those key questions to really identify where someone is in order to get them the help and services they need. I think from a, a wider topic as well, we need to also look at neurodiversity linked to financial well-being. And within FINWA as well, there's many lessons to be learned in terms of how people, for example, that have ADHD and how they manage people. It's about understanding how people's brains work very differently. So I see more and more a trend around these different cultures, neurodiversity. We also have to take into consideration things like gender pay gap. We have spoken about it quite a lot. You've seen quite a lot in the press over the last three years. I think there's still more work to be done. In terms of also ESG, and we look at the 17 um, standard development goals from the United Nations, again, we have seen this level around financial well-being coming in the form of economically, how are we taking care of our people, our communities, etc. So it's not a topic that I expect to slow down on. I expect more momentum, but opening up more conversations. And I think financial well-being in terms of how it sits within this overall holistic well-being strategy connected to your business strategy is quite vital. So when we really drill into financial well-being, it's also about having a form of a strategy, because with all these things, we have to have a point of departure and a point of arrival. And in between, we are actually working our way through things. And there's two elements of that. We need to be strategic as well to the businesses that we are answering to in order to understand the data. Um, we know all businesses operate and want to see a value on investment or they want to see some form of KPIs. And that is realistic. We all want to benchmark ourselves and understand where we are and where we want to get to. So this is quite important as to why, even when it comes to financial well-being, that you have some form of strategic approach to really understand the various areas, because then you are able to tackle what you want to be doing in stage one, stage two or stage three. I think often what people are trying to do is they're trying to firefight. They either don't understand the scenario at the moment around financial well-being. And I'd really like to point out the reason why we also have a strategy is to also minimize some of the conversations around financial well-being. I know when I was a lead 
talking around financial well-being, how it can be very interpreted as a very scary topic because we're using the word finance. And this is where the differentiation becomes what is education, what is guidance and what is advice. So this is the reason why a strategic approach is the right way to go, because you can then divide up how you're going to approach year one, year two, year three, as to what are you going to tackle in the first instance. If I give you an example, if you have a workforce that's quite young, you know, the messaging that you're going to be thinking around you know, for a young population is going to be a very different conversation, perhaps, that you're going to be looking at if your workforce is predominantly, you know, nearing or close to the age of retirement or looking at their pensions. So I think these are the kind of things you need to be considering and why we say a strategic approach is really key and crucial. So it enables you as well to, in some aspects, also bring it back to the business strategy and be able to show how movement has been made. I guess what areas employers should be considering when it comes to their strategy for financial well-being really is around things that perhaps you have not looked at. And this is often the area that goes unchecked, you know, and there's probably a lot that organizations are doing. So things like addressing and looking at your, your pay and pensions, for example, are you a living wage employer? It's one thing you could be considering and having a look at looking at your benefits, because as well with some of the benefits, there could be efficiencies in terms of cashback schemes, etc. you know, depending on what benefits you have in place. So consider those as well in your financial well-being strategy. Thinking about access to affordable credit is another option and perhaps something that you haven't uh, considered. You know, things like access to education, guidance and advice, especially when it comes to the whole plethora of things that people are looking at at the moment. And it's also looking at things perhaps that you've overlooked, like the policies around expenses. You know, depending on where you work on your travel expenses, it's usually that you pay for the expenses and then claim them back from the business. So it's how do we minimize the strain on the individual that the individual doesn't feel like they're taking on more than, than they can financially. So these are just some of the examples. And of course, this is where the strategic approach comes in, in terms of how we would look at or across the board doing an audit in terms of what do you have in place today and what actually is available to plug some of those gaps so you understand what is available and what you can actually use.